This is Stone Playground. It didn't used to look like this. This was a big part of my life because like, I could see my creations coming to life and I really liked it. I was working with a group of adults that thought I didn't know what I was doing until they gave me the tools and they decided to put the slide on backwards and I told them before to put it on the right way they didn't want to listen to me until the main people that work here told them it's on backwards. So I stopped helping them after that and I went to go help out somebody else on the swings. Well, this is West Chicago over here and this is St. Suzanne and it's a very known um, community building. We do a lot of programs in it. I go to school here and I work here and I have another program that I do here. So there's a lot of things going on in this. The place that we are right now is um, Joy, Joy Road and Southfield. Like what you want to know about it. How do you feel? Is this a safe corner? What's the history of this area? Well, if you can see the murder back behind us, it's not not um, a very safe place. I really don't know much about Joy Road because I never could go to Joy Road. Actually, I never crossed the train tracks. So, hey, good evening, everyone. I am Skylar Pounds. And my name is Marnisha Davenport. Okay. How many of you are concerned about the quality of houses and properties in our neighborhood? Most of you, right? Okay, it's some, some good blocks in our neighborhood. The lawns are made up. There are places for little kids to play. These houses might be small, but the people that live inside keep them up to par and keep them really nice. Where I live, it's good because I'm closer to my family. I live by a grocery store, a laundromat, and my school is on the street. So basically, everything is accessible, and I can walk walking distance. But there's also bad blocks, too, such as trash is on the ground. And the buildings are abandoned, like the houses and stuff are boarded up. Where I live, our landlord came out not too long ago, and we showed him the walls and how they've fallen apart. Ever since then, he just come, he just keeps asking and never fixes anything. He comes around only when the bills have to be paid. Actually, I don't even know that our landlord lives near us. I also see a lot of abandoned houses getting out the down in our neighborhood, but some just stay that way for a long time. Once we became neighborhood investigators, we went around, asked questions, and learned about why the houses and properties in our neighborhoods are this way. We asked questions like, who decides to knock down houses and keep them up? Why are houses in our community owned by slumlords? Why do we have to keep paying high rent for bad houses? Do we think our homes are safe for kids and teenagers? Well, this map here is interesting because it shows that the black marks are owned by people outside of our neighborhood. Nearly half of our neighborhood are owned by people or companies not in our zip code. And our houses are old. This map shows the most of the buildings in our neighborhoods are built sometimes in 40s and 50s. Besides looking at many maps, we reached out to people who know a lot about houses and apartments, like Mr. Rock. Rod Liggins and Miss Megan McGrill. They are DLBA, also known as the Detroit Land Bank Authority. Detroit Land Bank Authority, we oversee the city's residential properties. Currently, the city has about 95,000, just under 95,000 parcels of land, and we're the largest land bank in the state and probably even in the country. The land bank came about because there was a, a need to have all of the city's residential properties in one location and we were as staffed. We started out five years ago, there was maybe 30, 35 employees here. We have over 150 now because we had gone from maybe 17,000 to, like I said before, up to 95,000. Our primary focus is making sure the properties that are salvageable are put back into productive use. Side lots, the vacant lots next to somebody's home, we sell for $100. It doesn't sound like a lot. We get about $50 each a year in property taxes. As of the today, we've sold 11,068 side lots. That's over $550,000 now coming into the city by way of property taxes that was not there before. 
The same with the houses. Once we get a house torn down that's blighted, property values go up anywhere from 4 to 7 percent that day. And they only continue to increase. Between 2013 and 18, property values in Detroit, not downtown or midtown, but in the neighborhoods, have increased by 97 percent. So these are things that we try to let people know that it's a powerful thing to own your own home. It's great to live here and rent. We have great landlords, but we also have some problems with slumlords and they don't really take care of their properties, but they're always collecting money. We would rather have those tenants become homeowners and we, the way we do that is make the houses available through our sales programs. We will be considered what's called quasi-government, which means that we will be beholden and we're under the authority of the Quasi? mayor, quasi-government. And that's what I'm explaining. Give me a second. Quasi-government means you're not exactly a city or government department, but you that's where your funding comes from. That's where your uh, rulings come from. We work very closely with the mayor as well as the city council in the city of Detroit. They have authorization over, we have a board of directors and we have an executive director, but we take our direct leadership from the mayor's office because this is a strong mayor run city. They told us about the DLBA owns one of five houses and properties in our neighborhood. This is what we do every day. The first thing I would ask them is if they are tenants to just add up the amount of money they pay in rent. And the fact that they're paying money to someone else for the privilege of living in their house as opposed to owning their own. Like I said before, if you want to paint the walls, you have to get permission. You want to hang a picture or change the carpet, you have to get permission. You don't do that in your own. And having a home of your own is equity. Now we know these houses need a lot of work and we let them know beforehand. We even let them know there are lenders on our website that will help them fund a purchase and rehab of a house. But we make no mistake, we know this is a heavy lift. It's gonna take some work. And we have Detroit contractors. We just had a contractor workshop just last Saturday where we're trying to get Detroit contractors work. You don't have to go outside of the city to get roofers and, and uh, people that can do plumbing and electrical work. So we see this as not just putting the house back into productive use, but we're creating jobs, we're creating new homeowners, and we're stabilizing neighborhoods. When people are moving in and out from tenant to tenant to tenant, you don't know who's moving in there. But if somebody has bought it and they decide to live there, that becomes a much stabilized neighborhood. We also visited Building Safety and Engineering and Environmental Departments, known as BC. There we met Arthur Edge, who is in charge of making sure that houses and properties are demolished safely. My name is Arthur Leon Edge. I am a supervisor for the City of Detroit Building Safety Environmental Engineering Division, Dangerous Buildings. I am responsible for the blight that is here in our city and it's um, making a difference as far as making it safe for young people like you. I'm much older than you all when I was your age. I'd never seen an abandoned building. When I drive around Detroit, I see there are some communities that are blighted and I feel that it is my responsibility to make the difference in that to help get this cleaned up. I take it personally when I see some of these blighted areas. I take it personally because it's my job, first of all, and I think about the people that are living in that community. So it's my job to get it cleaned up to make it safe for them. I was out there in the streets and I've seen it for myself every day. Bodies, uh, drug addicts that have OD'd in the house. Why do you think there's so many abandoned buildings in Detroit? Well, it's many things. Um, one of the main issues was, um, if we go back with the foreclosure issues, um, people walked away from their homes. Uh, then there was a lot of blight that people have stripped homes. And those were the main two issues. And then we naturally have some fires, cases of fires. But the main thing is that the uh, a few years ago we had a foreclosure problem and a lot of people walked away from their homes. So for the next year, with our neighborhood framework, 
we should learn more about how the land bank works because the rules can be very complicated. And we should give better support to small neighborhood developers and contractors who are trying to buy houses and fix them up around our neighborhoods. And maybe young people can be a part of this too. We could help fix the porches, earn some money during it, while gaining building business ills. What if at the end of the project we are ready to start our own porch fixing business? And from our investigation, we learned housing problems are way complex and there's a lot to learn. Ms. Linda Campbell broke it down for us a little bit. We believe that um, all Detroiters uh, have a right to quality and affordable housing based on their income. What's very important for individuals and families is that you have stable quality housing. And if you're afraid that your rent will increase or your rent is increasing, you're facing the threat of eviction and you're having to move all, move all the time, that's really disruptive to a family. So we see quality affordable housing is key. We think that blight is important, but we have to look at what the root cause of blight is. Why are there so many blighted homes in our communities? And a lot of that has to do with the housing policies, right? People can't afford their homes. Many of them lost their homes through no fault of their own. And so we're left, you all are left, to walk by there every day on your way to school or to the bus stop and look at that when actually a lot of that was caused by institutions, financial institutions based on greed, you know, who targeted people for corrupt mortgages and people weren't able to pay them because people wanted homes, right? So yes, people are going to take advantage of what they think is a good opportunity only to find out later on they were sold a bill of goods. So, so that, it's a very sad situation in terms of why blight exists in our neighborhood. A lot of times we just focus on the what, like all these messed up houses in my neighborhood, but we don't really say why. Why are there so many messed up neighborhoods in our neighborhood, houses in our neighborhoods? Understanding the why of why there's so many vacancies and blighted homes in our community, and even now, who continues to benefit from that situation? You always have to ask yourself why a situation exists and who's benefiting. Who's benefiting from this condition in our community? And that helps you kind of dig deeper and helps you to develop an analysis and an understanding. So it's just not talking about the what, which is pretty apparent to all of us. We see the what all around us, but the why. So if you are interested in discussing more about houses, apartments, and properties in our neighborhood, you better come to a public discussion. We have tables where you can sign up better. Um, 